Dr. Barney? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. So, can you please share your slide? In the meantime, we will start by seven. We have okay. five minutes. Okay. okay. Can you guys see it? Uh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's visible.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Devargya Dattabanik. So, and I also th want to thank the organizers of PPB webinar series for in uh, introducing me. So, today's topic, uh, the title of topic is Peripheral Test Signaling, New Proteins and New Pathways. So, by training, I am a test neurophysiologist and what I did in my PhD was to figure out how the test receptor cells use different signaling pathways to detect different test chemicals and send the information back to the brain. So why test system is so important for us the, in all the organisms? Because test system is used to determine whether a potential food item will be ingested or rejected. And it is one of the five sensory system, but till today, it is the least understood and least studied sensory system. So some kind of chemical sensory system in, is present in all organisms, starting from a single celled amoeba to us humans. And it is actually the oldest sensory system. And why should we care about test system? Because if you lose your test system, then you will definitely lose your appetite. And if you lose your appetite, you will stop eating and that will definitely lead to malnutrition. On the other hand, if you think about if there is any dysfunction in your test system, that may also lead to overeating and that may lead to obesity. Another important aspect of test system is if you think about the patient who, are, who have cancer, and going through chemotherapy treatment. So the test cells, they go through a renewal process every two weeks. So older test cells die and newer test cells take their place. So these chemotherapy drugs actually affect this test renewal process. So older cells die, but the newer cells can't take their place. So what happens 
In those chemotherapy patients, they don't have any test cells, so they can't taste any food and they stop eating food. And as a result, they lose a lot of weight. So we all know that one of the major side effects of chemotherapy drug is uh, loss of weight. So this is actually the inherent reason why those people lose a lot of weight because their taste system is totally gone and they can't taste food and stop eating. And also, you know that today, uh, this year, one of the very big uh, topic is the COVID-19 infection pandemic. And one of the very first symptoms of COVID-19 infection is actually agoesia, which is total complete test loss. So this is why we think we should study test, test system more and we should figure out how these test cells detect different test compounds. So before I go into my data today, let's go back to the basic of test system. So we know there are five major test qualities. So these five major test qualities can be divided between uh, appetitive test qualities and aversive test qualities. So appetitive means we like them. So the first appetitive test quality is sweet, which identifies calorie and carbohydrate rich food items like chocolate cake or any sweet items. Then Umami, which identifies amino acids, which in turn identifies protein-rich foods. And third one is salty, which is actually important for maintaining ionic or electrolyte balance inside our body. And then we have aversive test qualities. Aversive means the test qualities we want to avoid. So the first one is sour. So sour identifies acid or potentially spoiled food items. So if there is any bacterial growth in your food, those bacteria will produce different acids. And this is an evolutionary mechanism to identify spoiled food items or the presence of bacteria in your food. And the fifth one is bitter, which identifies potential poison or toxins. So a lot of plant chemicals are toxic to humans and animals, and those chemicals are mostly bitter in taste. So all these five test qualities are actually identified by test receptor cells. So the majority of the test receptor cells are actually located in your oral cavity and mostly on your tongue, but they are also located in some other parts. So they are located in upper palate. They are also located in your airways. They are located in your lungs and some kind of chemosensory cells are also present in your gut, uh, and brain also. So for today's talk, we are only going to focus on the test receptor cells that are located on tongue. So these test receptor cells are innervated by different gustatory nerves and all the gustatory nerves form their first order synaptic relay in a particular area of the brain, which is present in hind brain called nucleus of solitary tract, which is located here. And from there, the information goes to the higher order structures in the brain like gustatory cortex and we get the sensation of taste. So for today's talk, we are going to focus on tongue also, tongue only. So these taste receptor cells are not located everywhere on your tongue. They are located in specialized groups or bumps called papillae. So we have three different types of papillae in our tongue. We have fungiform papillae in anterior two third of the tongue we have foliate papillae on the side of the tongue, and we have circumvallate papillae on back of the tongue. So how does this papillae look like? So if you make a cross section through a circumvallate papillae, this is how it looks like. So these are the taste scripts on both sides of the papillae. And when you're chewing your food and your food chemical gets mixed with the saliva, those uh, that mixture of saliva and food items comes into these test scripts. And if you see these so small green structures, those are individual taste buds. So taste buds are the structure that houses test receptor cells. So how does a taste bud look like? So this is how a taste bud look like. So the taste buds open, they have an apical test pore through which they communicate, they open to the test script. So this part is the test script. So when the food chemicals mixed with saliva comes into the test scripts, they enter the test bud through that apical test pore and all the cells, test cells, they have their receptors located on this apical side. So those food chemicals bind to their receptors and the test receptor cells then activate different signaling pathways to 
convert that chemical signal into an electrical signal that the brain can understand. And after processing of that information, the electrical signal then send are sent back to the brain using the afferent gustatory nerve and the brain then understand what is the test information. So individual test buds actually contain 50 to 150 test cells. And this is a heterogeneous population of cells. And when I say heterogeneous, that means there are different types of cells present inside a test bud. So the first type of cell is the basal cell. Since I told you that test cells get renewed every two weeks, so there has to be a renewal process. So these basal cells are the progenitor cells that actually give rise to mature test receptor cells. And then we have type 1 cells. So these cells have glial cell-like properties and they work as a supporting cell. And then we have type 2 cells. So these are the cells, according to our current dogma, are uh, known to detect bittersweet and umami stimuli. And we have type 3 cells, and these are the only type uh, test cells that are known to have chemical synapse with afferent gustatory nerves, and they are known to detect only sour and salty stimulus, according to our current model of the test system. So we know that there are different types of cells present in uh, a test bud. But whatever, and they use different signaling pathways to send the information to the brain. Like type 2 cell, they detect bittersweet umami using a G protein coupled receptor signaling pathway that I'm going to go into details in next slide. And type 3 cells, they use uh, salty and sour stimuli using a ionotropic signaling pathway. However, whatever signaling pathway they are using, they both require calcium signals to release neurotransmitter. So without calcium signal, they can't release neurotransmitter to the afferent gustatory nerve. And that's why we say that calcium is the most important second messenger in test signaling pathways. So for the first part of my talk, I'm going to focus on the type 2 signaling pathway. So type 2 test receptor cells have a very unique signaling pathway. And why do we call it unique? Because unlike most excitable cells like neurons or muscles, these cells do not have voltage-gated calcium channels, nor they have conventional chemical synapse, but they still release neurotransmitter. But how do they do that? So the current dogma of the field is that bittersweet and umami, they are detected by their receptors, which are G-protein coupled receptors, and they activate a phospholipase C beta-2 signaling pathway, which causes calcium release from the internal store. In this case, is endoplasmic reticulum. When calcium gets released in cytoplasm, that calcium release activates a protein called TRIPM5, a monovalent selective trip channel, which only passes sodium through it. So when TRIPM5 opens, sodium gets inside the cell, and since sodium is a positively charged ion, it depolarizes the cell. And that cell depolarization activates firing of an action potential, which opens a channel called CalHM1, and ATP, which acts as a neurotransmitter in these cells, gets released onto the gustatory nerve, and the information then sent back to the brain. So we first focused on this particular protein called TRIPM5. Why did we focus on this protein called TRIPM5? Because there are contrasting evidences uh, about its role in this entire signal transduction process. So what are the evidences? So there is one group, uh, they generated their own TRIPM5 knockout mice, and they reported that the loss of TRIPM5 abolished all gustatory nerve responses and behavioral responses to all bittersweet and umami stimuli. And since this paper was published in Cell, this paper single-handedly established the current dogma of the field that only type 2 cells detect bittersweet umami using this strict GPCR, PLC beta 2, IP3R3, TRIPM5 signaling pathway. However, there is another big group. They generated their own TRIPM5 knockout mice, and they came to a conclusion that when TRIPM5 is knocked out, the gustatory nerve responses and behavioral responses are reduced, but not completely abolished to bittersweet and umami stimuli. 
So now we have two different evidences. First is saying if you knock out triple five, all bitter, sweet, and umami responses are gone. And the other group is saying if you knock out triple five, then it's reduced but not completely gone. So the question was, what's actually going on? So my PhD boss, Dr. Catherine Medler, belongs to the second group who thinks that tryptophan five is not the only protein important in the entire signaling pathway. So we hypothesize that there might be another channel which is contributing to the depolarization in absence of tryptophan five, and we predicted. That this channel would have similar characteristics as tryptophan five, which, unlike other trip channels, is monovalent cation specific, and primarily passes sodium through it. And the only other known trip channel uh, which have the similar characteristics is tryptophan four. So that was kind of like our idea that maybe tryptophan four is important in this signaling pathway. but we did not know anything about tryptophan four's presence in test cells and nobody no lab has uh, evaluated its role so there was only one rna seq data uh, available and they actually showed that tryptophan four mrna is present in test cells but we did not know whether tryptophan four protein is present in test cells or not so that's what we did at the beginning So we did an immunohistochemistry experiment to figure out whether tryptophan four is expressed in uh, test cells or not. So we have a genetically modified mice where uh, a GFP tag is inserted into the tryptophan five protein. So all the cells that have tryptophan five will now have also have a GFP signal into them. And since tryptophan five is only present in type two cells, all the type two cells have GFP signal. So when we did this experiment, uh, immunohistochemistry experiment, we found there was a very high level of co-localization between tryptophan four and this tryptophan five GFP signal. So actually, there was nine, more than ninety-five percent co-localization. And this paper was published in two thousand eighteen. So if you want to know more about this paper, you can follow that paper. So now we know that tryptophan four protein is present in more. More than ninety-five percent of the type two cells, but we did not know whether tryptophan four is functional or not. So to know to identify the function of a protein in test cells, we do live cell imaging. So what we do, we isolate single test cells from the tongue and we evaluate taste evoked responses to bitter, sweet, and umami compounds. So this is how it looks like. So this is actually a single isolated test cells sitting on a cover slip, and we we loaded the cell with fluorescent dyes. Depending on what experiments we are doing, we can load calcium specific dye, sodium specific dye, voltage sensitive dye, anything. So we, that is how it looks like after loading with dye, and this is how it looks like when it's stimulated with a. Uh, Suppose a bitter or sweet compound, and this is how it looks like in our result. So this is a result of a live cell imaging. So the x-axis is time in seconds, and the y-axis is calcium concentration. So because this is a calcium imaging experiment, so this particular cell was stimulated with an artificial sweetener called sucralose, and this particular cell responded to it, and that's why there was an increase in uh, fluorescent, and that's what. Detects whether the cell is releasing calcium or not. So, for our purpose, for our experiments, we wanted to measure taste evoked sodium responses. And why we wanted to measure sodium responses? Because both our target proteins, tryptophan four and tryptophan five, are sodium selective channels. However, there is not a single lab. So we already knew that this bitter, sweet, and umami stimuli—they all generate a calcium signals in this type two cells. So that's why we decided to do a dual sodium calcium imaging just to make sure that the taste evoked sodium, the sodium responses we are getting are actually test specific. So if we get a simultaneous sodium and calcium responses to this bitter sweet umami, then we know that our prep is working, and we can convince ourselves and uh, scientific field. So what did we find? So when we did the experiment in wild type cells, wild type type two cells, we got simultaneous sodium and calcium responses. 
So in all these experiments, x-axis is the time. We have two lines. The black line is the calcium trace and the red line is the sodium trace. And also the black y-axis is the calcium concentration and the red y-axis is the relative amount of sodium inside the cell. So you can see in all when we applied bitter, sweet and umami compound, wild type type 2 cells, we generated simultaneous sodium and calcium responses. So now we know that our PrEP, our PrEP of dual sodium calcium imaging is actually working. So let's focus, if we knock out TRIPM5, what happens? So let's go back to the model. According to the model, TRIPM5 is the only sodium selective channel in the entire signaling pathway. So we already knew that TRIPM5 is partly contributing to uh, generate this test tube of sodium responses. And if the model is correct, if we knock out TRIPM5, then the test tube of sodium responses should be abolished. Did we find that? Let's see. So when we did the experiment in TRIPM5 knockout uh, type 2 cell, we are still finding uh, so test tube of sodium responses in these cells. So it's showing us that there might be another channel contributing to generate these responses when TRIPM5 is not there. And according to our hypothesis, that protein is TRIPM4. So when we did the same experiment with in TRIPM5 knockout type 2 cells using a TRIPM4 specific inhibitor called 9 phenanthrol this is what we found. So we are still getting a test tube of uh, sodium response, and this test tube of sodium response is completely abolished when we applied that TRIPM4 inhibitor. And after washout period, the signal comes back. This actually showed us that TRIPM4 is also contributing to generate the test tube of sodium responses in these cells. So now we know that both TRIPM5 and TRIPM4 are contributing. So let's see what happens if we knock out both TRIPM4 and TRIPM5 from type 2 cells. So we generated a TRIPM4-5 double knockout mice. And when we did the dual sodium calcium imaging in these cells, we found that the test tube calcium response was still present. This actually showed us that the cells are still viable. They are healthy. They are lively cells. But taste of sodium response, which is in the red line, is completely gone. So this, this confirmed our finding that both TRIPM4 and TRIPM5 are actually necessary and sufficient to generate the taste of sodium responses in these cells. So all these experiments were actually done in isolated cells on cover slips. So we did not know, actually, whether if we knock out TRIPM4 or TRIPM5, what is happening in the mouse actually? What is their test specific behaviors? So that's why we decided to do a test specific behavior experiments in the mice. So this experiment is actually called short term leak assay experiment. And it was done by our collaborator at UB, Dr. Anne Marie Torregrossel's lab. So, what is the main information you need to know about this experiment? So, in the short term leak assay experiment, the mouse is given a choice between water and a test solution. So if a mouse likes a solution like sweet, it's only going to drink the uh, sweet solution. It's totally going to avoid water. On the other hand, if a mouse is given a choice between water and bitter solution, it's only going to drink water. It's only going to avoid bitter solution because mouse hates bitter solution. And if there is any problem in their test system, they will not be able to uh, have good uh, in, uh, preference for the either bitter solution or sweet solution. And if they can't test anything, they will lose, they will treat the sweet solution or the bitter solution just as water. So what did we find? So in all these graphs, the black line is the wild type trace and red and green lines are actually the data from either TRIPM4 knockout or TRIPM5 knockout mice. And the blue line is the TRIPM4-5 double knockout mice. So you can see for bitter, the wild type mice, they hated bitter solution. So as the concentration increased, they avoided bitter more and more. When either of the proteins are knocked out, their test preference were, was impaired. And when TRIPM4 and 5 both were knocked out, they could not distinguish between the bitter solution and water at all. For sweet, 
while type mice like sweet solution they drank a lot of sweet solution however when either trypan 4 or 5 were knocked out their taste preference was significantly impaired and look at the double knockout data at all concentration of the sweet solution they just treated that sweet solution just as water and for umami wild type mice liked it when either of the proteins were knocked out their taste preference were impaired and when both proteins were knocked out they could not tell the difference between the umami solution and the water solution so this actually showed us that trypan 4 and 5 are both important for generating the taste preference for umami bitter and sweet in mice so that's why we concluded that both trypan 4 and trypan 5 contribute to generate taste evoke sodium responses and loss of either of these proteins significantly impaired both cellular and behavioral responses and loss of both channels abolished cellular and behavioral responses to bitter sweet and umami and that's why we think the model needs an update and both trypan 4 and trypan 5 are downstream of this plc beta 2 gpcr signaling pathway so while we are doing this experiment we also found that when functional type 2 cells are absent there are many many test cells that actually responded to bitter sweet or umami test stimuli and when i say that functional type 2 cells are absent this is what i mean so this is the model of type 2 cell so what we did we knocked out this protein called ip3r3 and when the ip3r3 protein is knocked out the type 2 cells can't release calcium and when calcium is not getting released all these downstream signaling pathways are silenced they can't work so that's what we are saying functional type 2 cells are absent and what did we find what we found that there are still some t- cells test cells that are responding to bitter sweet and umami and this uh, finding was published just 3 weeks ago in plos genetics so this result was actually very surprising from two fronts first of all we are now finding there are cells individual test cells that are responding to multiple bitter sweet and umami compounds which is totally unheard of why because according to current belief or current dogma of the test field a single test cell can only identify bitter compound so bitter cells identify bitter compound sweet cells identify sweet compound and umami cells identify umami compounds not a single cell can respond to all three of them so that was one surprising finding of this result and the second surprising one was when we applied high potassium solution these cells were responding to that high potassium solution we use high potassium solution to identify type 3 test receptor cells so type 3 cells are actually considered only to detect sour and salty stimulus they are not known to detect bitter sweet and umami but now we are finding that some type 3 cells are actually responding to bitter sweet and umami which was very surprising for us so we wanted to further analyze or further study this population of cell we actually found that some type 3 cells are actually broadly responsive so this is a part individual test cells it's a calcium imaging experiment so you see by definition all type 3 cells responds to sour stimuli so when we applied citric acid which is a sour stimuli we found the cell responded to that citric acid and the cell also responded to high potassium um, because it's a type 3 cell however the cell also responded to bitter denatonium sucralose which is sweet and mpg which is an umami stimulus so that was very surprising and we named this population of cell broadly responsive cell so when we analyzed the type 3 cell data we actually found that the majority of the type 3 cells were actually broadly responsive so 52% of the broadly responsive type 3 uh, type 3 cells were actually broadly responsive and they uh, respond to both sour and as well as bitter sweet and umami we found around 28% of the type 3 cells responded to only sour solution and we found 20% of the type 3 cell responded to sour and salty however we did not find a single cell that responded to 
all bitter sweet and umami compound and uh, all five taste compound sorry so next we wanted to know what is the source of uh, uh, yeah, somebody has presented the screen so what if you don't mind can you start presenting and present this slide again what sorry which slide and this slide this slide okay. you were going to go now so can you please stop presenting and then again you can present the same because it is not visible oh, we can sorry. see the slides you can see the slide now Uh, yes so we can see the slides if you are pinning your uh, like the when you are presenting the screen if you are pinning to that we can see the slides i'm sorry i'm interrupting but we can see the no, slides okay. you can't see it. actually in youtube it we is... can see no it, it's fine the devil go ahead it's it's working okay it's working so we wanted to make uh, we wanted to know what is the source of this calcium signal in the broadly responsive cell so we did a series of experiment the first experiment was we did the experiment in presence of uh, calcium free solution so calcium free means the external calcium solution calcium was removed so if we are still getting a calcium response in this cells that will mean that the calcium is not coming from outside the cell it's a calcium release signal from the inter, uh, from the internal store so what did we find in the broadly responsive cell so when we did the experiment in presence of calcium free solution we are still getting a calcium response so that showed us that it's a calcium release signal from the internal store we confirmed our result using a compound called thapsigargin so thapsigargin um, deplete the internal calcium store so what we found when internal calcium store was depleted the taste evo calcium responses was completely abolished in this broadly responsive cell and finally when it did the same experiment in presence of a compound called u73122 which is a phospholipase c enzyme inhibitor we again found that the taste evo calcium response was completely gone in this broadly responsive cell so this three experiments actually showed us that it's a calcium release signal from the internal store and it's a phospholipase c mediated pathway okay so now we know that the broadly responsive cells is a calcium response it's a calcium release and it's a due to a phospholipase c signaling pathway but what are the phospholipase c uh, protein that is contributing to generate this signal now the known phospholipase c isoform elc beta 2 is only present in type 2 cells so we did uh, rna seq analysis and we found there was another isoform of plc called phospholipase c beta 3 which is highly enriched in test cells and we predicted that plc beta 3 actually may be responsible for this test evo calcium responses in this broadly responsive cells so let's see where this phospholipase beta 3 protein is present so we did a immunohistochemistry experiment so we used phospholipase beta 2 as a type 2 cell marker and what we found that phospholipase beta 3 is not um, overlapping with phospholipase beta 2 expression that showed us that plc beta 3 is not present in type 2 cells then we used another marker called snap 25 which is a marker for type 3 cells and we found that there was there was some kind of co-localization between plc beta 3 and snap 25 which actually showed us that plc beta 3 is present in a subset of type 3 cell and it actually matches with our prediction because broadly responsive cell is actually a subset of type 3 cell so next we wanted to know if we knock out plc beta 3 what happens to this broadly responsive cells so we generated a plc beta 3 knockout mice and when we did the uh, live cell imaging experiment in this mice we found that there was a significant loss of beta sweet and umami responses in this broadly responsive cell when plc beta 3 is knocked out and surprisingly if you see the foliate papillary data and the fungiform papillary data there was not a single broadly responsive cell present when plc beta 3 was knocked out 
and all the four PLC, uh, broadly responsive cells we found in the knockout mice, this, those were all present in circumvallate papillae. So this actually strengthened our point that PLC beta-3 is important in bittersweet umami responses in these broadly responsive cells. So now we know that there are two types of cells that respond to bittersweet umami, type 2 cells and broadly responsive type 3 cells. But we did not know whether the brain is receiving signals from both these cells. And that's why we decided to do an experiment to measure the neural activity in the brain. So I told you that the gustatory nerves form first order synaptic relay into hindbrain, a particular area of the hindbrain called nucleus of solitary tract. So we wanted to measure the CFOS activity. So CFOS is a transcription factor, but it's also used as a marker for neuronal activity. So we wanted to measure the neural activity in the nucleus of solitary tract. So let's see what we found. So this is the particular area I am talking about in the hindbrain, and this is what it looks like in our experiment. So this, the right side is the slide of, uh, section of the brain, and the right side is the anatomical structure, and this dashed area is actually the nucleus of solitary tract. So what we did, we gave the mouse an oral infusion of bitter solution quinine, and then we measured the CFOS leveling in the nucleus of solitary tract. So what we found in wild-type mice, where both type 2 and broadly responsive cells are present, there was a robust CFOS leveling in the nucleus of solitary tract. However, when type 2 cells were knocked out and type broadly responsive cells were knocked out, there was a significant reduction of CFOS leveling in that part of the brain. And we used water as our negative control because all these solutions were dissolved in water. We wanted to make sure what, whether water makes any CFOS leveling there. And th that was very negligible. So when we analyzed our data, we found that when I broadly responsive cell and type 2 cells were knocked out, the brain is, there was a significant reduction of CFOS leveling. And it shows that the brain is actually not receiving any signal when either of the cell population is silenced. And finally, we did behavior experiment. It's the same short-term leak assay experiment uh, done by Dr. Anne-Marie Torregrosso's lab. And we found that wild-type mice, again, they hated bitter solution and they drank very less amount of it. But when either of the cell population was knocked out, they could not distinguish between the bitter solution and water up to a very, very high concentration. For sucrose, which is sweet, wild-type mice liked sucrose solution and they drank a lot of it. However, when either of the cell population was knocked out, they could not distinguish between the water and sucrose at all. And for umami, same thing, uh, wild-type mice liked it, but when either cell population was knocked out, the mice were totally indifferent to umami solution at all concentration. So this showed us that input from both these signaling pathways are actually required to send the test information to the brain. So this is the summary for this part, that some type 3 cells express a PLC beta 3 signaling pathway and can respond to bittersweet and umami stimuli. And loss of either IP303 in type 2 cells and PLC beta 3 in broadly responsive cell abolishes bittersweet umami responses and su which suggests that input from both this cell is needed for normal test response. So this is what we think is happening. So this is the test bird. We have both type 2 cell and broadly responsive type 3 cell, and there may be some kind of cell-to-cell -cell communication is happening. We don't know. We have to figure out that. Also, the second um, possibility is that the gustatory nerve may be acting as a coincidence detector. So it needs the information from both these cells to send a uh, complete information to the brain. And when the information goes to the brain, there is a neural activity there, and that actually causes our behavior. And that made us to decide whether to eat a food or not to eat a food. So with that, I want to acknowledge my PhD advisor, Dr. Catherine Medler, and our collaborator, Dr. Anne-Marie Torregrossa and Dr. Stefan Roberts. 
and the mem the past and current members of Maitland Lab, Roberts Lab, and Torrey Grosser Lab, and also the funding agency National Science Foundation, my PhD university University at Buffalo, my current employer Indiana University School of Medicine. And also, I want to thank Dr. Aina Banerjee, Dr. Shonak Shahu, and all the organizers of Progress and Prospect Biology webinar series for inviting me to give this talk. And I also want to thank everybody to listen for listening. And with that, I want to thank all of you. And with that, I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shahu, for inviting talk. So we have uh, questions over here. So, uh, first of all, Shraddha Mahendra wanted to know, do these taste receptors have to do something with gut microbiome? Uh, that's a very good question. So, some kind of like we don't say them test cells. We call them chemosensory cells. So, some kind of these chemosensory cells are actually present in gut. So, that the current belief of the field is that those uh, gut chemosensory cells are there to actually detect different chemicals from the gut microbiome. So that's actually it's a very good possibility that those cells, the gut cells, they actually communicate with the gut microbiome. So in connection with that question, what are the consequences of this signaling pathways and proteins? Okay. So it's a very new emerging field. So those gut uh, cells, the gut chemosensory cells were discovered very uh, recently. So very few labs actually have uh, gone into like signaling pathways, but we already know that uh, the PLC beta 2 protein is present in those gut uh, cells. And also we know that trypm 5 protein is present in those cells. But we still don't know the other components of the test pathway are present in those cells or not. So that's probably going to be figured out in next few years. Okay. So Ajanta Chatterjee has asked, why do some people get hypersensitivity to some food and inflamed papilla, whereas others don't? Uh, that's a good question, but... Uh, I, to frankly speaking, I don't know the answer for that. But maybe uh, we don't know whether there is any allergic reaction to food items that may be happening. But I don't know the answer for that. Sorry about that. So another question is, can we do gene expression studies instead of immunohistochemistry to know the expression pattern through artificial? Uh, yes, we can actually. So a lot of labs actually does uh, these gene expression studies. So so first of all, like they do those gene expression studies first to just to get a global idea of like what genes or proteins are present. Genes are present in test cells, but to further confirm that they are present or not, you have to do RT PCR and immunohistochemistry. And sometimes you also have to do like fluorescent in situ hybridization to see whether the mRNA is actually present. So yeah, the answer is yes. You can definitely do gene expression studies in test, test cells. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, another question is, what is the relevance of this study in terms of medical scenario, which can be applied in human sub subjects as well? So first of all, so yeah, like most of the test studies are actually done in mouse. However, uh, mouse test system and human test system are very similar. So we have the same component, same signaling pathways. So that's why like if we figure out what is happening in the test system in the mouse, we can definitely apply the same uh, principle in human. And as I told you at the beginning, like... So the, in the medical perspective, like, yeah, like chemotherapy patients, they lose their test at all. Uh, so, yeah, that is like an emerging field to figure out what happens to test system when patients go through chemotherapy drugs. And also there are some other diseases. I can't uh, remember the names at the top of my head, but 
there have been in uh, evidences that some diseases actually also affect these different test compounds, uh, like test signaling pathways that affect their uh, test pathways, uh, test sensations. Okay. So the next question is from uh, Prabhahan Chakravarti. How do BR cells distinguish between different types of stimuli? Uh, is there a difference between degree of single cell response magnitude between two kinds of stimuli or it, is it population coding? So that's a very good question. So it's actually both. So if you think about like a single, like a broadly responsive cell, we found that yes, there are differences in the single uh, signal amplitude between bittersweet and umami. So how much calcium is getting released per versus bitter versus sweet, it's different. So probably that is one measure of how the cells distinguish between bitter solution to sweet solution. And the, the second part is yes. Uh, so this model of uh, coding, like test coding in the brain is called... Um, uh, it's like it's a population like us all population of broadly responsive cell and type 2 cells is kind of like activity so depending on their activity on the test receptor cells the brain gets the information it's a whole population that makes the signal oh, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt you uh, would you mind yeah. turning on the video so that people can see you oh sorry Is it working? Yeah. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Sorry about that. So another question is from Devashri Onar. Uh, please tell why is the ability to taste decrease in diabetes patient? That's a good question, but uh, I don't think uh, any test labs are actually looking at diabetes uh, and their correlation with test sensitivity. So that's why I don't have like the information about that. But maybe it's also a possibility that diabetes also affect the signaling pathways, like some components of the signaling pathway that may cause the reduction in their sensitivity to different test compounds. But I don't think anybody has looked into that yet. So the next question is from Vishwadeep Ghoshwal. Is there any correlation between inflammation and the ability to taste in this perspective? Uh, that's a good question. So I didn't understand the, um, like, what about the information? So, yeah, like, if the cell can't... Uh, identify or can't get the information about the cell uh, or different test compounds, the brain is not going to get any information. And that's what happens all the time. Like, so if you like just open your skull and then apply some test compounds on your brain, the brain is not going to do anything. So all this information has to be sent from the test receptor cells. And the test receptor cells are the only cells that get the information about these different test compounds. So yeah, they are definitely linked about the test sensitivity and the information. Okay. So there is another question from the uh, Is there any relation between hormones and taste preferences? Uh, it's a very good question and it's like, uh, it's a possibility. So a lot of labs, I guess, like these are all new fields. Like I told you that a lot of information about test system, how it works is not known yet. But I think there are like very few studies like done in recent times that actually shown that different kinds of the test cells actually have different hormone receptors also. So that may be, uh, may, they may have an effect on test sensitivity, but it, probably will take some few years to figure out how do they do it. So yeah, we have to wait for a few more years to figure out that question. Okay, so this is the last question from Priyajit Biswal. 
uh, how this signaling related to loss of taste during disease condition like fever so um, as i told you like uh, so there is a, this taste renewal process so it may happen so we know that covid 19 so the the receptor for covid 19 is s uh, the s receptor type 2 i think that s2 receptor is actually present in test cells so somehow they are binding those uh, uh, um, viruses onto the test receptor cells and then they are somehow affecting the signaling components uh, i don't know i think people are doing work on that but nothing has been published yet but i think for the fever so like when the temperature gets raised i think that somehow affect the test renewal process because everything has to be like around our normal body temperature so somehow like in high temperature maybe that same renewal process gets disrupted and like those new cells can't take their place and that's why the test system is impaired and we can't test food during fever or something okay so uh, there are some questions are coming in you don't mind i can put them No, it's the, okay. Okay. So, uh, Sumit Roy uh, has asked: Is there any significant role of potassium and sodium ions in taste-related protein signaling? Please explain. So, there are actually different potassium channels present, but uh, potassium actually plays an important role in sour sense, sour signaling pathway. So. there are a protein um, potassium channel that is used to depolarize the cell during the sour signaling pathway and sodium actually plays a very important role in actually all cell uh, test cell population so as i told you like in trip in type 2 cell it has trip m4 and trip m5 that are both sodium selective channels and if you don't have these two channels the cell will not get depolarized and there will be no neurotransmitter release same way in type 3 cells the test cell uh, those cells have voltage gated sodium channel and if you don't have uh, those channels again type 3 cells will not get depolarized and will not release any neurotransmitter so both potassium and sodium are actually playing very important role in the signaling pathways okay so the chaudhary uh, has asked does including nsl in diet enhance testing of food due to enhanced signaling to sodium um that's a good question so actually sodium chloride generally is considered a uh, like appetitive test quality but at low concentration so if you go beyond like less than uh 250 millimolar concentration of sodium chloride it's actually appetitive test quality so we like that test solution and there may be uh some like communication between type 3 cells and type 2 cells during sodium response that may be enhancing the sweet or bitter responses for sweet sodium however at higher concentration sodium also gets becomes uh, aversive test quality so if you like very high concentration of sodium we don't like the solution and that's kind of becomes like aversive test signaling pathway and that kind of like known like it's a recent finding that higher sodium concentration actually like activate the bitter signaling pathway like it's kind of like an aversive test quality pathway so yeah at low concentration sodium is appetitive but it may enhance the taste of other food compounds okay. so another question is from ranjana himalayan uh, uh, when you are doing a uh, study in live mouse the mouse must be consuming all taste but how responding to only one taste can you explain please I did not understand the question. Sorry about that. Can you like, repeat the question, please? In uh, mice model, when we are studying uh, this taste signaling, so mouse is uh, taking all kind of taste, right? Uh, uh, sweet, bitter, and all. 
but how it is responding to one particular test we want to uh, and that's what the question is okay so a single test score so they have their receptors for that so so those receptors are completely separate so the beta receptors only respond to beta compound and sweet receptors and umami receptors they are completely separate so they only respond to that single test quality so even if they are like we are giving them a bitter solution that only is activating the bitter receptors and that's how we know that okay they are only detecting the bitter because there is no it's not shown that okay the sweet receptors also bind to bitter compound that doesn't happen But when we are giving them bitter solution it only activates bitter compound bitter receptor and the bitter signaling pathway it's a common signaling pathway but the first component is the receptors and the receptors are completely separate so that's how that's how the cell distinguish between bitter sweet and umami compounds okay so another question is from pankaj kumar singh uh, he is asking whether mouth also is related to taste bud how it can be corrected uh uh that's a good question but actually i don't know the answer of so yeah maybe uh when you have your mouth ulcer that may be happening where the either fungi from like if you are if your mouth ulcer is present in front of your tongue it may be happening in the area where your fungi from papillaries are and if the ulcer is in the back of the tongue maybe is near the cv and that mouth ulcer may affect your test perception but yeah nobody has uh, done any studies if i remember correctly so yeah maybe it's happening but we don't know definitely whether it affecting your test system okay that's all i think we have the question so thank you so much dr kanya for being here and uh, 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 on behalf of the entire uh, uh, cpv team i would like to thank you again uh, for being here and sharing your research work in this platform so uh, um, i would also like to thank all the participants for joining in today's webinar for the upcoming events please stay tuned to our youtube channel and the facebook page Uh, then, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. Have a good day. Yes, thank you, Nandita, for uh, moderating to the session and to Dr. Devarga Dutta Gonik for taking the time uh, to speak in the webinar series. Uh, Devarga is a very are uh, is one of the very few speakers whom I actually have in mind to kick off the webinar series. While it took a long time to coordinate with him uh, with the exact exact dates. uh but we all tested a very interesting topic today uh with that we'll be back uh, next week uh, same time again and our speaker is the mentor of the webinar series professor narayan banerji talking on lung regeneration uh registration will be starting uh, from tomorrow so stay tuned uh, to our youtube page and our facebook links to uh, get all the updates uh thank you very much once again for joining today and uh hope to see you again next week have a good day thank you devarga thank you thank you